everyone to the Frank Islam Athenaeum Symposia Speaker Series. My name is Tiffany Banks. I'm Professor of Communication Studies here and also coordinator for the Frank Islam Athenaeum Symposia. It's a pleasure to have all of you here today. It's great to see you. Thank you for supporting the Athenaeum. If you'd like to receive emails about upcoming speakers, we do have another event at the end of the month. You can find out more information by going to our website, www.montgomerycollege.edu slash Athenaeum. You can also sign up for our mailing list there as well. Before we get going today, I have a couple of items of business that I'd like to review with you. If you're a student and you need a certificate of attendance, you can get that certificate at the table upstairs. Um, please make sure that you grab one of those before you leave today. I'd ask that everyone would please silence your cell phones so that we, um, and also uh, if you could uh, darken your screens to minimize any distractions during today's event. After uh, our speaker today, there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers. Uh, so what we'd ask is that you'd please find your way to the two microphones in the main aisles here. And at the designated time, we'll invite you to come and ask Mr. Farrell any questions that you have um, at the end of his talk. Also, we hope that you'll stay till the end of the event today. We have a surprise for you that we definitely don't want you to miss out on. So please, if you can, stay till the end. In addition to the surprise, we'll have some light refreshments available for you outside in the main entranceway for you to enjoy. And in addition to that, if that wasn't good enough, uh, Mr. Farrell has kindly agreed to sign some copies of his books, which will be available for purchase. So you can uh, do all of that up on the main floor at the end of the event today. At this time, I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor Lee Annis. Um, Professor Annis is going to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Annis joined Montgomery College in 1986. He's taught at all three of our campuses and currently he serves as the chair of the Rockville Department of History and Political Science. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Annis to the stage today. Some of y'all think we have a rather controversial president today. Well, going back to the time when I was growing up and Mr. Farrell was growing up, we had an even more uh, controversial one. Probably people might think that because unlike our current president, Richard Nixon had been around for a generation. He had friends and he had enemies and both were passionate accumulated over a generation, and here is a tremendously complicated man. In a bit of research that I did, I looked into Richard Nixon and uh, something called Hurricane Camille. You never heard of that, I'll bet you, right? And one of the reasons you never heard about it was because the federal government with Democrats and Republicans acting together with Richard Nixon and Birch Bayh and Jim Eastland Birch Bayh, you probably haven't heard of, real liberal Democrat, Jim Eastland, a segregationist. They worked upon it to make sure that aid was provided quickly. You all have heard about Katrina in New Orleans, and that was a mess for months. But things did work a little bit better back in those days. With Richard Nixon, though, you have a puzzle. The man of ambition who rose to the highest position in America from a rather poor, lower middle class origin. You have a man who, as Jack Farrell is going to lay out, did uh, torpedo a potential solution of the uh, Vietnam War in 1968, right before the election, but also a man who did get through Congress the most advanced uh, environmental program in the Western world. You have a, a man who engaged in the most uh, uh, torrid political scandal uh, in American history that we know of yet. But you also have a guy who opened the door to China, uh, made the first strategic arms deal with the Soviet Union, and did see to it that schools were finally desegregated under court order, controversially, in 1970, but it happened with only one incident. So in Richard Nixon, you have one of the great puzzles in American history. And 
in Jack Farrell, you have a guy who had done uh, tremendous biographies of Clarence Darrow and Tip O'Neill. Uh, you also have a guy who solved the puzzle of Richard Nixon more, uh, better in one 700-page book than any other person before uh, in the 70 plus years since Richard Nixon took office uh, as a member of the House of Representatives in 1946 and first on the national scene almost immediately with a case which still is remembered called the Altra Hiss case. So please remember, uh, please uh, give a welcome to the best historian in my, at my high school, <laughs> Robert E. Perry, uh, Jack Farrell. Okay, well, I can go home now because that, that's the themes of my, of my presentation today. Um, it's, uh, that was one of those introductions like Lyndon Johnson used to tell the story when somebody would give him a, uh, a great introduction like that. He would say, I really wish my parents were here because that's the kind of introduction that my father would appreciate and my mother would believe. <laughs> um, the question that I've most often asked uh, as I go around the country peddling my book is why Nixon now? And I've been accused, um, as Lee did, of uh, being something of an oracle, <clears throat> of somehow knowing back when I began the book in 2011 um, that Donald Trump would be president, facing off against a special counsel over a break-in at the Democratic National Committee, staging his own Saturday night massacres, and declaring that the press is the enemy, accused of colluding with a foreign power to illegally affect the outcome of a presidential election. And as a friend of mine from the faculty at the University of Virginia told me, we've packed six years of Nixon into 14 months of Trump. It's like Nixon speed dating. Uh, well, as Harry Truman once said, there's nothing new in human nature. Men don't change, the only thing new in the world is the history that you don't know. Uh, we are not, and never will be, as James Madison noted, a government of angels. Um, we can be sure that somewhere from his perch in the great hereafter, that Richard Nixon is looking up at us now <laughs> and saying, you see, Bob, I told you they would miss me when I'm gone. Why Nixon now? Uh, there's another reason to remember, especially in these tumultual times. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the year that he was elected, um, a series of commemorations that we are now experiencing that you'll see on uh, television every night as we progress through the year. It was an astounding year. It began with the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, um, shaking America's feelings about um, the war. Senator Eugene McCarthy mounted an anti-war challenge to President Lyndon Johnson with near victory in the New Hampshire primary. Robert Kennedy joined the race. Alabama Governor George Wallace had a hate-filled candidacy that year. Lyndon Johnson abdicated, announcing that he would not run for re-election. Dr. Martin Luther King was murdered. Robert Kennedy was assassinated. And there was rioting at the Democratic Convention in Chicago. Nixon almost didn't make it. He won ultimately by 500,000 votes in one of the closest elections ever. And he barely clinched the Republican nomination. Michigan Governor George Romney, yes, Mitt Romney's dad, was the Republican frontrunner until attempting to change his position on the Vietnam War, he claimed that he had been brainwashed by the Pentagon. And this did not persuade a skeptical public that Romney had the brains or the guts to serve as commander in chief. Brainwashed, said Eugene McCarthy when, asked, when told of Romney's gaffe, a light rinse would have been sufficient. And it was during the 68 race, on the eve of the election, that the Nixon campaign pulled off a trick that I, in my book, argue was worse than anything that happened in Watergate. In October of that year, Lyndon Johnson announced that he had reached an agreement for peace talks with the North Vietnamese. At the urging of the Soviet Union, 
which was the North's armorer and supplier, the United States would suspend the bombing in Southeast Asia. And in return, the Russians promised Hanoi would engage in productive talks. But then there was a hitch. The South Vietnamese refused to join in the talks. Johnson was furious, all the more so when he learned that a woman named Anna Chenault, a Nixon campaign official, had been heard on a US government wiretap of the South Vietnamese embassy, urging Saigon to drag its feet. They would get, she promised, a better deal if Nixon were elected. We could stop the killing out there, Johnson can be heard telling the Senate Republican leader, Everett Dirksen, on a White House tape recording. But they've got this new formula put in there, namely, wait on Nixon. And they're killing four or 500 a day, waiting on Nixon. This is treason, said LBJ. I know, said Dirksen. So Johnson faced the choice that Barack Obama faced in the fall of 2016. He did not have proof of Nixon's personal collusion with a foreign power, and Nixon vehemently denied it, as he would for all his life. Does any of this sound familiar? And to go public with that information in the home stretch of an election was to reveal first the US surveillance of a wartime alley, South Vietnam, and two, the FBI's eavesdropping on the rival party's presidential campaign. And so Johnson, like Obama, made the decision to sit on the information. He sealed all the records and documents in an envelope, which became known as the X-File. It was stashed away in the Johnson Presidential Library in Austin, Texas, and not opened again until this century. But somehow, mysteriously, as these things happened in Washington, the news of the Chenault affair leaked out. And it became a grail for investigative reporters and historians to prove that Nixon had known of and directed Anna Chenault's activities. Well, you can Google the Chenault affair or go to the US State Department historian's website with a very lengthy chapter on the incident to see how the pieces of the puzzle emerged over the last 50 years. But always, Nixon denied a role. In his famous interviews with newsman David Frost, he insisted he was not aware of, nor had he authorized any contact with the South Vietnamese and, quote, could not have done that in good conscience. It was not until 2013, while conducting the research for my biography, that I found the scrawled notes of his chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, recording Nixon's orders to keep Anna Chenault working on the South Vietnamese and to do what they could to monkey wrench Johnson's announcement of the peace initiative. Now, we can't know what might have happened if the Nixon campaign had not interfered. Most likely, given the incredible enmity and stubbornness that North and South Vietnam displayed in the years that followed, the, Rus the Russians' promise of productive talks would have failed. Why is it important? Well, I'm a biographer. I judge my subjects by what they knew and what they did in their time. And given Nixon's willingness to engage in such a dark plot, given the bloody debacle that would follow in Cambodia and in Vietnam, I came to the conclusion that indeed this was more reprehensible than anything that had happened in Watergate. But here's a warning for you who want to know all there is to know about the Russian interference in the 2016 election. Eat well exercise, be prepared to wait, and hopefully it won't take you all 50 years. But there's more to say about this complex man than to dwell on his greatest hits. Why Nixon now? Well, we live in a world that Richard Nixon made. His February 1972 opening to China, that planet-stunning handshake with Mao Zedong set Earth and its peoples on a new and liberating course. It was the first crack in the Cold War, the first bell tolling for the Iron Curtain, the indispensable step towards the integrated world economy we have today that has lifted billions of human beings from want and granted them, as Nixon so fervently hoped, a measure of peace. After losing the 1960 election to John F. Kennedy and the 1962 race for California governor, the one where he held that famous last press conference and promised that you'd never have Nixon to kick around anymore. He moved to New York and as an international lawyer, roamed the world for a prominent client, Pepsi-Cola. 
But everywhere he went in those wilderness years, he stopped to talk to U.S. diplomats and foreign statesmen, many of whom he knew or had met on international missions when he was vice president under President Eisenhower. It was like one great postgraduate seminar. And in 1967, in an article in Foreign Affairs magazine called Asia After Vietnam, Nixon described the world to come. Monolithic communism was doomed, he wrote. The new age would be an information age built around a technical revolution, a computer age. And this age would require freedom and intellectual nimbleness, not factory lines and collective farms. And it was so ill-suited for totalitarian regimes like the Soviet Union and the USSR. The nations of the Pacific Rim, Japan, Indonesia, Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, would lead the way in this new age in Asia. But there was one great danger, China. The Chinese had to be brought out of their shell and integrated into this new international economic order. It was against American political dogma. But all that progress and the promise of peace that could last a generation would be lost if a rampant, nuclear-armed Red China sought to solve the problem of its billion hungry, restless, and enslaved people with violent expansion and aggression. And so, in 1969, when the Chinese and the Soviets engaged in a ridiculous border dispute over a godforsaken riverbank in Siberia, and thank God they did, the door to Beijing opened a crack, and Nixon was prepared. And he had the foresight and the courage to reach out to Mao and to Zhao Enlai. And on the White House tapes, you can hear him selling this to members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans who came into the Oval Office. And he promises them 20 years of peace. He says, I think this could bring 20 years of peace, a generation freed from a nuclear conflagration or a third world war. And that peace is now at 50 years and counting. So not for nothing did Mr. Spock, urging the hot-tempered Captain Kirk to negotiate with the evil Klingon Empire, remind Captain Kirk that there is an old Vulcan proverb, only Nixon could go to China. Oh, we should have seen it coming. He was elected to the House in 1946 and instantly made an impression to its leadership. When they needed a committee to travel to Europe and evaluate George Marshall's plan to rebuild that shattered continent, Nixon was chosen to go, a freshman. He roamed far and wide, impressing all who met him. He saw the shattered cities of France and Italy and Germany. He stood amid the ruins of Adolf Hitler's chancellery, where Berlin's orphans crowded around him, trying to sell him this rich American, their father's war medals. Much was at stake, including Nixon's political future. For the rock-ribbed Republicans of Orange County, California, the very men who had plucked Lieutenant Richard Nixon from obscurity and built and paid for the campaign that sent him to Washington, were thoroughly against this Marshall Plan. They saw it as socialism, foreign aid, a waste of money, pouring sand down a rat hole, they told him. They warned him. They told him not to count on their support if he endorsed Marshall's mushy thinking. But Richard Nixon saw what he must do. He returned to the district. And for six months in 1947 and early 1948, he campaigned for the Marshall Plan in this hostile territory. He went to every Rotary Club, every Chamber of Commerce, every VFW and American Legion Hall that would take him, anybody that would listen to him. He owed them, he told them, his best judgment, not slavish obedience. And he persuaded them. And when the party primaries were over in California in the summer of 1948, Richard Nixon had not just won the Republican nomination, he had won the Democratic nomination as well. He had wagered everything, and he had carried the day. And the Marshall Plan went on to be perhaps the single greatest triumph of American diplomacy. Why Nixon now? His is truly a compelling story. There may be no great airport named after Richard Nixon, no high school here in Montgomery County, Nixon High School. But there are films and there are books, and there's one hell of an opera. Did you know that the evil empire in the Star Wars movie was patterned by George Lucas on the Nixon administration? That the tortured Don Draper, the star of the miniseries Mad Men, was modeled on Richard Nixon? And there's a reason why in the movies, 
when the bad guys pull on Richard Nixon masks as they prepare to stick up a bank, that everybody my age laughs. He's our only president to resign in disgrace. It was Senator Bob Dole who, joining the U.S. delegation to Egyptian President Anwar Sadat's funeral, came upon President Jimmy Carter, President Gerald Ford, and President Richard Nixon and said, there they were, see no evil, hear no evil, and evil. <laughs> and yet it was that same Bob Dole who was terribly wounded in Northern Italy in World War II. So that they wrote on his forehead in his own blood to signify the medics that there was nothing more that could be done for him. Who recovered, but lost the use of his right arm and thereby could not perform that most elemental political task, the handshake. And it was Bob Dowell who would tell you that of all his fellow senators, of all the Republican committeemen and delegates and Chamber of Commerce chairmen, there was one man in politics who never neglected to extend his left hand when greeting Bob Dole, and that man was Richard Nixon. And it was Bob Dole who broke down, his features contorted, weeping, giving the eulogy of Nixon's funeral. The original title for this book was Richard Nixon and American Tragedy, for his story most definitely has elements of classic Greek or Shakespearean tragic. And this is not my poetic flourish. Cabinet members like Elliot Richardson and Henry Kissinger were struck by it at the time. They talked about it on the White House tapes amongst each other and wrote it down in their books and their memoirs. Wrote Kissinger, deeply insecure, Nixon first acted as if cruel fate had singled him out for rejection. And then he contrived to make sure that his premonition came to pass. Well, it was said of Henry Kissinger that he was a self-made man who worshiped his creator. That's not Richard Nixon. Nixon was not an easy man to like. He knew it, and it hurt. He had a Dickensian childhood. His dad was brutal and abusive, a miserly tyrant. Two of Richard's brothers died in childhood. One, the curly, golden-haired baby of the family, Arthur, died in days from tubercular meningitis. The oldest, the pride of the family, Harold, took years to succumb from tuberculosis splitting the family as, the mother, as their mother took him away to care for him, wrecking the family's finances. Dick made it into Yale and Harvard, but his family could not afford to send him. And he came to believe that it was his father's stubbornness that was at fault for refusing to discard the family cow whose tubercular tainted milk had killed his brothers. His mother was cold. She would go into her closet to pray. And as Nixon famously said, Never once did she tell him that she loved him. That was not their family's way. He came to feel, and he told this to David Frost, that he was unlovable. A horrible thing for a person to feel, that you're unlovable. And it all left him plagued by an intense, painful insecurity and self-doubt. And he became Iago to his own Othello, whispering in his own ear, you're a loathsome creature, no one likes you, you're no good. And so he compensated, he campaigned with ferocity and ruthless aggression, and in doing so became that tragic figure. We can glimpse the seeds of Watergate in Nixon's actions as the precursor, a kind of John the Baptist for Senator Joe McCarthy. His red baiting campaigns which helped launch the McCarthy era are justly famous. But nowhere is the tragic flaw clearer. Nowhere is the good and bad, the yin and yang of Richard Nixon clearer than in the matter of race. He grew up in Whittier, a Quaker outpost in Southern California. And in college, he was the founder of a social club that remarkably, for the 1930s, recruited and accepted black members. When he first ran for Congress in 1946, he spoke out for racial justice, 1946. And the local NAACP made him an honorary member in the same season that the Klan was burning crosses in Southern California to defeat a referendum on fair employment. And when he won his first Senate race in 1950, one of his great supporters was a guy named Kenny Washington, a teammate of Jackie Robinson at UCLA and the first black athlete to integrate the National Football League, a year before Robinson took the field for baseball's Brooklyn Dodgers. They held the victory party that year at Kenny Washington's home. In the 1950s, Nixon befriended both Jackie Robinson and Martin Luther King, 
quite a daring move for a politician with national ambitions. And after getting Nixon's help in passing the 1957 Civil Rights Bill, Martin Luther King wrote in a letter that it is altogether possible that Nixon has no basic racial prejudice. And it wasn't just the public Nixon, it wasn't just the politician. Whittier had a black shoeshine man who worked in the town barbershop and sent his daughter to Columbia University. And when they visited Washington, Nixon invited them as his guests, two years before Brown versus Board of Education, to have lunch with them among all the senators, all the southern senators in the Senate dining room. And I found this letter in the Nixon Library from Nixon back to his, to his law partner, a private letter in Whittier. She's a very pretty and intelligent girl, Nixon wrote. It renews your faith in the country to realize that the daughter of a barbershop boot black could get a master's degree from Columbia standing in the higher percentage of her class. Well, Dr. King was very impressed by Nixon's liberality and political skill. But he was a perceptive man, and he was a bit wary. There's a danger in such a personality, as Nixon, he wrote to a friend, that it will be turned on merely for political expedience, when at bottom the real man has insincere motives. I hope this is not the case, Dr. King wrote. If Richard Nixon is not sincere, he's the most dangerous man in America. Well, King's assessment was borne out in the 1960 presidential campaign, which Nixon lost to John F. Kennedy. There are many reasons for that loss. Nixon botched the first debate. He made a rash promise to campaign in all 50 states and wasted time in the last week of the election in Alaska. As importantly, in keeping that 50-state promise, he found he could draw large crowds in the then Democratic Solid South. And so he, like John F. Kennedy, his opponent, sought to walk an edge to balance the campaign for white Southern votes with that from black neighborhoods in Northern cities. Well, the telling moment arrived when, near the end of the campaign, King was arrested in Georgia on an old traffic charge, shackled and taken to a backwoods prison in the middle of the night. His friends and family feared with reason that he would not emerge alive. And John and Robert Kennedy interceded with the governor of Georgia and got Martin Luther King freed. And the Nixon campaign, when asked if they would support that action, said, no comment. Jackie Robinson flew to where Nixon was campaigning in Chicago and begged the candidate, the candidate to intercede. Nixon refused, and Robinson left the hotel suite with tears of frustration, anger, and disillusionment. I had known Nixon longer. He had been supposedly close to me and would call me frequently about things, seeking my advice, Dr. King recalled. And yet when this moment came, it was like he had never heard of me, you see. So this is why I really finally considered him a moral coward. And so it was the Kennedys who did a better job of walking that line that fall, holding on to enough border states while turning out majorities in the black districts of the northern cities to make a difference in a race decided by 113,000 votes. And when Nixon ran again in 1968, Jackie Robinson supported his opponent, Nelson Rockefeller. And when Richard Nixon was elected president, the Nixon White House had Jackie Robinson investigated and a dossier compiled by the FBI. The story has a postscript, as almost every story about Nixon does. So Nixon is elected president, and the Supreme Court says that the time for stalling is over. The Kennedy and the Johnson administrations had not done enough to fulfill the orders of Brown versus Board of Education. The schools were to be immediately segregated in the South, and this burden, this job, fell to Richard Nixon. And he accomplished it so deftly with so little violence, with so little controversy, that he never got credit for it. It just happened. He's the greatest single desegregator of Southern schools in our history, Richard Nixon. There was evidence in 1960 that the campaign, the Kennedy campaign had stolen votes, enough to win in Illinois and in Texas. Now Jack Kennedy was Richard Nixon's friend. Pat and Dick had been invited to Jack and Jackie's wedding. And Nixon refused to campaign in Massachusetts when Kennedy ran for re-election to the Senate. He's the kind of man the country needs, said the young John Kennedy after meeting Nixon in the House of Representatives. And Nixon prayed aloud, poor brave Jack is going to die. Oh God, don't let him die, as Kennedy dodged death on an operating table in 1954. 
And so the hurt and the anger were twice as intense when Nixon concluded the Kennedys had stolen the 60 election. And Nixon's daughter, Julie, said it was the experience of 1960 that left her father with a grim resolve of never going to be outcheated again. Well, Nick Nixon took his anger and his hatred and he honed it and he used it. He had an unequal ability to identify, to tap the grievances and resentment of class, of race, of envy. In part through self-discernment, Nixon recognized the defects of human character and employed the knowledge to manipulate his countrymen. He persuaded Americans to gnaw, to, as he did, on grievances and resentments and to look at each other as enemies. He was the first post-war politician and certainly the most successful to build a career on the deliberate, contrived polarization of the American people on issues like class, patriotism, and race. And that was the task he assigned to his vice president, Spiro Agnew, who, when accused of polarizing tactics, responded, I not only plead guilty to the charge, I'm flattered by it. And Nixon's staff wrote internal memos calling for the calculated and carefully contrived form of polarization that would occur when telling white Americans that their rights and their taxes were being taken to appease a lazy racial minority. And repercussions echo today. The Fox News style was founded by Roger Ailes, who was Richard Nixon's media advisor. And don't let the revisionists tell you that Watergate was a hoax, that Nixon was railroaded out of office by a Democratic Congress and a liberal press. The White House tapes are online. You can listen to all of them, whatever you want. If you can stomach the cynicism, cruelty, the anti-Semitism, and that nagging insecurity. There's an awful moment on one White House tapes where after he's returned from China, the greatest accomplishment of his career, and he's talking with Kissinger, and he can't bring himself to give himself credit for what he has done. He has to demean the accomplishment. And he says, you know, Henry, the American people are a bunch of sheep. They think that this big set of meetings and handshakes in China meant something when you and I know it didn't. It was just a campaign trick. It's awful to hear that. You want to reach through time and grab them by the lapels and say, no, you did great. It was a wonderful thing. But the little boys on the White House staff didn't know how to play the political game, Nixon decided. And he told Haldeman in the spring of 1971 that he would have to coach them. I want, Bob, more use of wiretapping, he said. Put your money on surveillance and so forth. Maybe it's the wrong thing to do, but I've got a feeling that if you're going to start, you have to start now, Nixon said. Maybe we can get a real scandal on any one of the leading Democrats. Scandal, leading Democrats, Haldeman echoed. Now you're talking, said Nixon. This too is Nixon's legacy and his mark upon our world. A country divided, clawing as itself, clawing at itself, as he did. And he did not recognize all this until the end. But there is no sense seen in politics, law, art, or commerce to match that of August 9, 1974, the tormented Nixon standing in the East Room, pouring out his guts in a rambling plea, a farewell to his staff. Only in war or assassinations do Americans experience these kind of mythic moments. His daughter, Tricia, recorded the scene in her diary. Don't trip over wires, stand on name marker, reach for mama's hand, hold it. Applause, daddy is speaking. People are letting tears roll down their cheeks. Must not look, must not think of it now, Trisha wrote. The real Nixon was being revealed as only he could reveal himself. By speaking from the heart, people could finally know daddy. It was not too late. He tried one more time to tell them who he was. How lonely, how alone. Nobody will ever write a book, probably, about my mother, he said. Well, I guess all of you would say this about your mother. My mother was a saint, and I think of her. Two boys dying of tuberculosis, nur nursing four others in order to raise the money so she could take care of my older brother in Arizona. Seeing each of them die, and when they died, it was like one of her own. Yes, she'll have no books written about her, but she was a saint. And then came proof of another Nixon characteristic, his astounding resilience. We think that when someone dear to us dies, we think that when we lose an election, we think that when we suffer a defeat, that all has ended, he told the crowd. Not true. It is only a beginning, always. 
The young must know it. The old must know it. It must always sustain us. Because the greatness comes and you're really tested when you take some knocks, some disappointments, when sadness comes. Because only if you've been in the deepest valley can you ever know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain. There was a faded doom about the man, Kissinger was thinking. Many in the audience wept. And in the end, from Richard Nixon came words as wise as ever spoken in the great old house, rich in self-knowledge purchased at a price. Always remember, others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them, and then you destroy yourself. Dick and Pat made their way to the South Lawn, walked down a long red carpet, shook hands with a funereal vice president, and climbed the steps of the presidential helicopter. At the last, Nixon turned and grimacing gave one sweeping defensive wave as if to ward off the unquenchable grief. Then he thrust his hand skyward, flashing the trademark V's for victory, and entered the helicopter. Army One lifted from the lawn, rose above the muggy capital, the National Mall dimmed in a summer morning's haze. Below, L'Enfant's grand boulevards and Brumidi's halls and corridors pulsed with visionaries, parvenus and hustlers, with dreams and scheming with avarice, ambition, rivalry, and purpose. The chopper soared over statues of heroes and moments to great, monuments to great statesmen whose ranks with such American audacity the awkward grocer's boy had presumed to join had come so near only to fail. It's so sad, Pat said to no one in particular. Why Nixon now? I believe that it's essential that we learn from Nixon's parting words. Today's hate and polarization are more than just a political phenomenon. They threaten, in this 21st century world, the American ideal. And that ideal is this, that a self-governed people varied in national origin, in faith, in the color of their skins, can still be, as Ronald Reagan told us, as John Winthrop preached upon the ship Arbella to his fellow pilgrims as they sailed into Massachusetts Bay a city on a hill. That the new world beacon not only shines for others about such virtues as liberty and equality, but demonstrates that in nations as diverse as ours, that these values are achievable. This is the challenge Americans face right now. And if we lose this battle here in this country with all its wealth, with all our sturdy institutions and deep abiding beliefs, we surrender all the hard won gains we've made in equality of gender, race, or sexual orientation, then it's difficult to see how other democracies resist hatred there. Now that, I would argue, was the meaning of Barack Obama's Nobel Peace Prize. Obama hadn't done anything particularly wonderful to qualify for it except win an election. It wasn't really given to him. It was to us. It was the world saying to us, bravo, keep it up. You inspire us. Keep being America. Well, we were that people then, and we'll be that people again. But we have to work at it. American success is no done deal. We may be exceptional, but we are not predestined to succeed. The American experiment is just that, an experiment. And experiments can fail. Dr. Benjamin Rush, signer of the Declaration of Independence, said as the revolution ended, nothing but the first act of a great drama has closed. And President John Adams, second president, said, we cannot guarantee success. We can do something better. We can work to deserve it. Our exceptionalism doesn't guarantee we'll always make the right choice. And the price today of the wrong choice is steep. After writing three books, I have now been christened an historian by the New York Times. And one thing that historians get to do is quote Abraham Lincoln. It's like getting your union card. And in 1838, foreseeing civil war, Lincoln told his countrymen, all the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined with all the treasure of the, of the earth, with Napoleon Bonaparte for a commander, could not by force take a drink from the Ohio River in a thousand years. At what point then is the approach of danger to be expected? If it ever reach us, Lincoln said, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and its finisher. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. And that's the lesson that Nixon taught us as well.
It is only, it is always a begin, it is only a beginning, always, he said, there in the East Room on the day he relinquished the presidency. Now, in the last year, I have been invited to lecture at Vanderbilt, at Ole Miss, at the University of Virginia, at Little Flagler College in Florida, Mary Washington, the University of Chicago, Brandeis, Washington, and Lee, and today at home here in Montgomery College. It is so reassuring having toured these campuses and engaged in conversation and debate with my children's generation that these millennials have figured it out. Long before Parkland, I saw that their values are good, fair, and generous. And so our task in the immediate future is to give them a chance, give you all a chance, to not tear ourselves apart, to not die by suicide, to not succumb to hatred. Americans always rally to meet outside threats, war, natural disaster, terrorist attacks. My parents' generation proved that, an army of free men and women, and an arsenal of democracy under the leadership of Churchill, Eisenhower, and Roosevelt, taking on, defeating the vilest totalitarian regime. But as Lincoln warns us, the threat today comes not from afar, but from ourselves. Because others may hate you, but if you hate them, that's when you destroy yourself. It is different and difficult and perhaps a more dangerous challenge. And I want to turn again one last time to Nixon's own words. Fifty years ago, to an audience in a prosperous Philadelphia suburb, Nixon said, We are a fortunate people, but you know that in the great cities of America, there's terrible poverty. There are poor people. There are people who haven't had a chance the chance you've had. You can't be an island in the world, Nixon told this audience of rich suburban, suburbanites outside of Philadelphia. You can't live in your comfortable houses and say, well, just as long as I get mine, I don't have to worry about the others. This isn't going to be a good country for any of us to live in until it's a good country for all of us to live in. And that is the real answer to the question, why Nixon now? So thank you for having me, and I'd be very pleased to answer any questions that you might have. I think we have a, a microphones, yeah. Good morning, thank you. What do you think that Nixon would think of Trump? Well, I think he would admire Trump's political gut instincts. Um, the man did get himself elected president of the United States against great odds, and I think Nixon would appreciate that. I think he would be astounded and dismayed by the loosey-goosey way that Trump handles foreign policy. Um, and maybe even domestic policy as well. One of the things I, I didn't talk about is the great domestic record that the that Nixon administration um, compiled. And finally, I think he would identify a little bit with Trump for being under attack from uh, the same forces that Nixon believed came against and took him down. Um, so it, it would be a, a mixed verdict, I think. I think he would probably um, chuckle at some of the antics, um, probably wished he had Twitter at, Fox News when he was president. Another question? Yeah, sure, raise your hand up there. <laughs> Come on, give me some more questions. No? Did you like the Star Wars analogy? <laughs> I said a long time believing that it had to have been Darth Vader that, that Lucas patterned uh, Nixon on, that this this arc of Anakin Skywalker going from good guy to bad guy to good guy at the end seemed like the arc of, of Nixon's life to me and fit very comfortably. And then I found that, no, it was Darth Vader's boss, the evil empire, that, that, that made the comparison for, for George Lucas. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned that, um, I think it was the late 1960s, that Nixon was successful in desegregation of the rest of the country. But you did not mention uh, how he did it, because from my own experience, it seems like that the years might have helped the situation rather than Nixon doing anything particular. Um, he was acting because the Supreme Court 
didn't give him any choice. He, given the choice, he probably would have done what Kennedy and Johnson did, which was the minimum possible. Um, but when the courts made it clear, the Supreme Court said this has got to happen and it's got to happen now. Um, Nixon had um, a, a, an incredibly talented staff. And among them were men like Daniel Patrick Moynihan and George Schultz and Len Garman. And he brought them together and he said, we gotta do this, and we gotta do this, we're gonna do this without riots, we're gonna do this without me sending federal troops to University of Mississippi or to Little Rock like Eisenhower and Kennedy had. Um, and so what they did is they went down to each southern state and they, they appointed a group of half minority and, and half white um, uh, community leaders and they brought them to Washington and George Saltz gave them uh, the promise of federal support and federal funding. And John Mitchell came in, the tough attorney general, and said this is happening no matter what. And when in the final moment they needed somebody to like push them over the edge, they brought them into the Oval Office. And Richard Nixon himself, who did not like this kind of one-on-one of -on -one interaction with folks, um, sat down with them and said, look, you know, we may agree, we may disagree, but the Supreme Court has said, said it. This is the law of the land. Our challenge as patriotic Americans is to make it happen the best way possible. I will give you the support you want, and I, I appeal to you sitting here in the Oval Office where so much American history has happened um, to do this and to do it well, and they did. Um, and uh, it did not change the complexion of America's neighborhoods, but in the South, in the affected states that the Supreme Court had ordered, those schools were desegregated, and the statistic, like, is astonishing, and it all happened in Nixon's time. Now, the one thing that, that, one reason that Nixon doesn't get credit about it and that we don't know about it is that he didn't want credit for it. He still was working his Southern strategy. He still wanted the South on his side in the next election. And so they, 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 they lowballed it. They, they, you know, as, as Daniel uh, Patrick Moynihan said years later, you know, this was something that he did not want to be known for in the South. He wanted to be known as the guy who appointed Southern conservative judges to the Supreme Court. Um, so it was one of those accomplishments that Nixon uh, never crowed about. And another one, an, a fascinating one, is uh, Title IX. I mean, we know that Nixon, with a stroke of his pen, created the Environmental Protection Agency and signed the Clean Air Act and uh, protected endangered species, with, worked with a Democratic Congress to get all this done. Um, but what's, what's given very little notice is that um, Richard Nixon um, signed the uh, authorization bill that created Title IX and opened up all those school programs to female athletes. He didn't particularly want to do it. Um, he had Father Herzberg from Notre Dame and Bear Bryant from Alabama and uh, um, uh, what's the name of the great coach from Ohio State? Woody Hayes. Woody Hayes all calling him on the phone saying, you can't do this. This is going to just going to destroy our football program. But given the choice between vetoing it and giving women th this uh, opportunity, Nixon chose to sign the bill. And if you go to the fantastic displays at the Nixon Library uh, in Yorba Linda, California, there very proudly on the wall um, is, is Title IX, which he probably had great misgivings at the time, and yet uh, went ahead and did make that final decision to sign and deserves credit for it. He also was the president in office when the first two nodes of the internet were connected. So he actually has the more justified claim than Al Gore to having invented the internet. Hi, um, good morning and thank you. Um, I, you, you mentioned that, um, that we survived Nixon, our democracy su survived Nixon, and um, I just finished reading Tyranny. Um, and I'm not so sure that we will, we will, um, you know, we will, we will survive Trump, to be honest. And so, <laughs> I'm not sure that our democracy, I mean, after having read Tyranny, I, I, I appreciate that you trust our democracy will survive, but please convince me that it will. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, we always have. That's the simplest answer. No matter how dark things get, and things get really, got really dark in, you know, 1860 and 1873, and um, you really can't say they got dark here at home in World War I, but certainly during the Depression in World War II, 9-11. We came together in 9-11. We, we, thought, we thought race had been cured after 9-11 and Obama's um, election. Um, and then we elected the first woman president three million, by three million votes. Um, 
she lost on a technicality, but the will of the American people was to say, yeah, a woman president is, is you know, that to me is a sign of, of progress. 500,000 people walking down Pennsylvania Avenue because a bunch of high school students in Florida don't like getting their, watching their classmates get shot down is, is, is another reason why um, I say that. And maybe, you know, maybe some of you guys in the, in the audience can help me with this. My belief is that the reason the Parkland students had such impact was that they did this as they walked out. And those snippets of video of their classmates and their teachers' bodies in the hall surrounded by pools of blood were never shown in Columbine, or they never shown in Connecticut. They were not shown in Las Vegas. They were not shown at the Pulse Na nightclub. That kind of stuff was kept from people. And I have the suspicion that the fact that the raw video of what a mass shooting feels like and looks like inside the classroom made a big difference um, that day, and it spread like wildfire, and that it really did make an impact in the, uh, you know, in the millennial generation. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, someday it's not going to, we're not going to be lucky. Someday, um, a, I mean, Donald Trump is not a dictator. He is not a tyrant. Um, he's a... Um, he's like P.T. Barnum. He's a showman. He's a, um, he's a demagogue. He's a skilled demagogue. Um, but, um, you know, one thing that scares me, and this, I share your fear, is the fact that a democracy has to work on truth. We have to work on a set belief in the science of government, in the science of science. We have to believe that there are, that there are basics that, that we all can hold on to. And the one thing that has happened that's very disturbing is there have been a very successful uh, attacks on truth um, just as a principle, that there is no truth. It's just, you know, there's, it's fake news. You can't believe anybody unless they're already in your camp and they're going to tell you what you want to believe. And that, that to me, as somebody who worked for many years as a journalist and then for the last 20 years as a historian, um, that's, that's frightening. I was up in, in Canada at McGill University last week and I said, them. I said, the thing that, that, that scares me and should scare you as our neighbors um, is this loss of um, the, the accepted notion that there are rational truths that, by which we make decisions, not ideological arguments. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Sir. Uh, good presentation. Thank you. And uh, just want to say I was, uh, uh, in 1974, I had just gotten out of the Navy. I spent... Uh, four and a half years in the Navy, and um, from 69 to 74 uh, during the Vietnam era, and uh, came back, and all of this was going on uh, after coming back overseas. And what's interesting, uh, difference between, <coughs> excuse me, uh, today with the internet and back then, is that we only had three networks back then. Uh, you didn't have the internet, and, um, and you had print media, basically. So you didn't have this immediate exchange of information. So it was kind of slower, percolated a little bit. So it was, if you had some comments on that. Yeah, I think that, um, I think it was our old friend John Dean was asked about this and he said that if Nixon had had Fox News, he probably could have survived. Um, I, I disagree slightly. I think that once the tapes came out, um, it, that his fate was sealed, and that was pretty much what members of Congress, Republican members of Congress, and what Nixon himself finally um, um, concluded. Um, one of the things I will say in his behalf is that as, as I went and interviewed old Nixon hands, um, um, one of their main arguments is that there's a great double standard between the way that we uh, treat Richard Nixon and we treat the other Cold War president. And I think that somewhere in the future, Historians are going to look back at the Cold War presidents as a whole and judge them together and with their successes, keeping us out of nuclear war, up, having the massive arms race and putting us in the danger down, Vietnam down, but maintaining civil liberties and eventually toppling the uh, Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall at the end. Um, they're going to put that all together, I think, and, and uh, um, Nixon has already risen from the bottom of the pack in the surveys of historians and the public. And uh, because he's the president that resigned, I never expect him to crack the top 10, but I think he's, I, I can't remember whether he's 29 or 39 these days, um, but I think it's 29 because it, it sort of took my breath away. And I think that over time, we will recognize that 
things like China, things like the EPA, um, much more important in our lives than, um, than what Watergate was. Thank you very much.